Hey guys, Dr. Gooden here to talk about acute responses to aerobic training. I'm Dr. Jacob Gooden, professor of kinesiology at Point Loma Nazarene University. And in this video, we will be talking about the acute or short-term immediate changes to your physiology when you undertake aerobic training. Now these are the acute physiological changes, not the long-term adaptations. I'll be covering that in the next video. But for now, let's dive into the acute responses to aerobic training. Now this information comes from chapter six of the Essentials of Strength Training and Conditioning. And this was written by Drs. Ann Swank and Carwin Sharp. Now one of the primary reasons why we undertake aerobic training is for the cardiovascular adaptations. But there's an acute cardiovascular response that we have to talk about. And stressing the cardiovascular system is what ultimately will drive beneficial adaptations. So the primary functions of the cardiovascular system during aerobic exercise are to both deliver oxygen as well as other nutrients to the working muscles and to remove metabolites and waste products. Now we want to think about aerobic training as kicking your body into overdrive. So if at rest, your cardiovascular system is responsible for transporting oxygen and carbon dioxide and removing waste products, that kicks into high gear during aerobic training. So we'll see in a minute that all of those processes increase many times above resting levels. Now some key terms to know are cardiac output, which is usually designated by an uppercase Q, sometimes with a dot over it, meaning the cardiac output per minute. And this is the amount of blood pumped by the heart in liters per minute. And we calculate this as stroke volume times heart rate. So stroke volume is essentially a measure of how much blood your heart pumps with every single beat. And then your heart rate, of course, is the number of beats per minute. So if you take the number of beats per minute and then your stroke volume and you multiply those, that's the amount of blood that your heart pumps per minute, which is cardiac output. Now during exercise, cardiac output will increase dramatically from resting levels, but then eventually it will plateau. Now with maximal exercise, cardiac output may increase up to four times the resting level. So you could be pumping as much as four times, maybe even more, uh, as much blood as you do during rest. So your heart is working overtime and it accomplishes this through, uh, partially through what's called the Frank-Starling mechanism. The Frank-Starling mechanism represents the relationship between stroke volume and end diastolic volume. So remember that end diastolic volume is the amount of filling that takes place in the heart at the end of the relaxation phase of the heart. So systolic is when the heart pumps and squeezes, diastolic is when the heart relaxes and fills with blood. And the more blood that it fills with, the greater that end diastolic volume of blood is, the more pre-stretch is put on the musculature and the harder the heart can pump. And so this Frank Starling mechanism says that stroke volume will increase in response to increased filling of the ventricles in the filling phase before contraction. So the primary responses then of the cardiovascular system involve stroke volume, heart rate increases, and oxygen uptake increases. So we've already talked about in diastolic volume increasing as a component of stroke volume. And we also know that at the onset of exercise, it's sympathetic stimulation that increases stroke volume. So these are things like epinephrine and norepinephrine, or the catecholamines. These increase the heart rate, but also the force of contraction of the heart. And you may have experienced this too, not just with exercise, but even if you're just scared or if you suddenly get stressed, that fight or flight response kicks in and you can just feel your heart beating out of your chest. Those are the catecholamines at play, increasing your stroke volume. Even if the heart rate doesn't necessarily increase, you can still get an increase in the stroke volume of your heart as it is contracting harder. Now heart rate will increase linearly with exercise intensity. So whereas stroke volume increases and then levels out, heart rate actually increases in a straight line in a linear fashion. Now oxygen uptake, which increases during 
aerobic exercise is directly related to the mass of exercising muscle, to metabolic efficiency, and to exercise intensity. So if you think about it, the more muscle mass that you have that you're using, the greater the oxygen demand of the body. So if we really want to stress our body's ability to utilize oxygen, then we need to bring a lot of muscle mass into play. This is one reason why a cross-country skier will typically have a higher VO2 max than a runner or than a cyclist. Because in cross-country skiing, you are forcefully using such a large amount of muscle mass because you're, you're pushing with your arms and pushing with your legs. And running, of course you have arm swing, but the arms aren't really propelling you forward. So for athletes who need to improve their oxygen uptake and really need to challenge their body's ability to utilize oxygen, we want to assign them aerobic training that utilizes a large amount of muscle mass. So this is where things like rowing machines or running or wind bikes, using which utilize the whole body are much better often than something like an arm bike or just seated cycling where the upper body is stationary. We want to think about activating as much musculature as possible to increase the demand for oxygen. Now since we're talking about max heart rate, it is important to know how to calculate the estimated max heart rate. So the easy way is to take your age and subtract it from 220. So if we have a 31 year old individual, we subtract that from 220 and we get an estimated max heart rate of 189. An alternative method based on meta-analysis is to take 208 and subtract from it your age times 0.7. So we take this same 31-year-old individual, 31, I have the calculator out, times 0.7, that equals 21. So uh, 208 minus 21.7 and we get 186.3. Now the second formula may be more accurate for young and healthy individuals, but know that either way there is some amount of error in that calculation. So you might be a little bit above or a little bit below that estimated max heart rate. Now here's a graph showing the heart rate and stroke volume interactions as we go from resting to maximal exercise. And notice that heart rate is linear, like we've already mentioned, and that stroke volume plateaus. But even though stroke volume plateaus, and we're still pumping the same amount of blood per heartbeat from about here to here, as heart rate goes up, the overall cardiac output will continue to rise as well because we're pumping the same amount of blood with each beat, but now our heart is beating more times per minute. So then, maximal oxygen uptake refers to the greatest amount of oxygen that can be used at the cellular level for the entire body. This is also known as VO2 max. The highest ever recorded VO2 max for men is 96 milliliters of oxygen per kilogram per minute, and for women, it's 77 milliliters of oxygen per kilogram per minute. Now at rest, we can estimate that we use about 3.5 milliliters per kilogram per minute, and 3.5 ml per kg per minute is the equivalent of one metabolic equivalent, or one met. Now some exercise physiologists and exercise scientists will assign met scores to different activities so a MET score is essentially the oxygen cost of that activity. Strength coaches and sport coaches typically don't rely on METs when they're prescribing exercise, although you might and that's okay, but we might see them used more frequently in say a cardiac rehab center. There are also blood pressure responses to exercise and we can see in this graph at the right that diastolic blood pressure remains just about constant whereas systolic blood pressure rises and no, I didn't spell this wrong. This is just from a study in a different language. So remember that systolic blood pressure is when the heart is contracting. So this estimates the pressure exerted against the arterial walls as blood is being ejected during vent ventricular contraction. Whereas diastolic pressure is used to estimate the pressure against the walls when no blood is being forced through the vessels. Now, as the cardiac output increases, as we go from rest to maximal exercise, the work done by the heart increases as well. And we call that the rate pressure product. 
It's what we use to quantify the work done by the heart. This is also called myocardial oxygen consumption. So to calculate rate pressure product, we take the heart rate and we multiply it by the systolic blood pressure. So this is essentially how forcefully the heart is contracting times the number of times the heart is beating per minute. Another term we need to know about is the mean arterial pressure, or MAP. And this is the average blood pressure throughout the cardiac cycle. MAP tends to be closer to the diastolic blood pressure than it does to the systolic blood pressure, so it's not, so we can't just take the average between systolic and diastolic. So the equation for MAP is systolic minus diastolic, so the difference between the two, and then we divide that by three, so that the difference between the two becomes now smaller, cut into a third, and then we add that to diastolic blood pressure. And that is a way to estimate the mean arterial pressure. So if we want to look at changes in blood pressure during exercise, remember that diastolic blood pressure remains mostly the same. It might even decrease slightly as you start to exercise intensely, but it's really the systolic blood pressure that changes. And it goes from the average range of about 110 to 139, above which is uh, prehypertensive, up into the 220s to 260s. Now, of course, it depends on the health of your heart and of your arteries and your age and a number of other factors, and these are just ranges. But just know that it just about doubles going from rest to maximal aerobic exercise. Another important acute change is the control of local circulation, which essentially redirects blood flow from your organs to your working muscles. So during exercise, blood flow to active muscles is considerably increased by the dilation of local arterioles. So essentially what your body is doing is it's rerouting blood from places of low priority to high priority. And, at, and when you're exercising, the highest priority is those working muscles. Your heart is essentially a slave to the muscles, right? The, the more you contract and move that musculature, the harder your heart has to work. And then your arterial system responds as well by essentially shunting blood to where it needs to go. So we see blood flow to other organ systems reduced by constriction of arterioles. And the change is pretty large. So at rest, only about 15 to 20 percent of cardiac output is distributed to muscle, whereas with vigorous exercise, it may be up to 90 percent of cardiac output. So during exercise, we see an acute change in the depth of breathing, so you're breathing more deeply, and the frequency of breathing. So you're breathing more rapidly, more times per minute. So during exercise, young healthy adults can increase their breaths per minute from 12 to 15, or like 8 if you meditate all the time and you're super woke, up to about 35 to 45 breaths per minute. And then the amount of air that we inhale and exhale with each breath, or tidal volume as it's called, increases as well from resting levels of about half to one liter to as much as three liters or even greater depending on your lung capacity. And with these together, with the increase in depth of breathing, in uh, frequency of breathing, and in tidal volume, we have an increase in the minute ventilation by up to 15 to 25 times the resting value. Now this slide shows how we break down the tidal volume in our lungs, and the total air that's inside our lungs is distributed between 350 milliliters of room air that mixes with alveolar air, about 150 milliliters of air in the larger passages, which is called anatomical dead space, because in those passages we can't actually have any oxygen and carbon dioxide exchange, and then a small portion of air distributed either to poorly ventilated or incompletely filled alveoli, which is called physiological dead space, meaning physiologically, even though we could have oxygen exchange, we actually don't because of that poor ventilation. So the key point is that during exercise, large amounts of oxygen diffuse from the capillaries into the tissues, increased levels of, of carbon dioxide move from the blood into the alveoli, and minute ventilation increases to maintain appropriate alveolar concentrations of these gases. So as you're exercising aerobically, 
your breath rate increases and the depth of your breathing increases. And it just feels like you need to breathe harder, right? But what's actually happening is your body, yes, it does need oxygen, but it also desperately needs to get rid of the carbon dioxide. So there's an exchange going on, not just an intake of oxygen, but an intake of oxygen in exchange for carbon dioxide, which is one of the byproducts of exercise. And so we need a gas exchange response. During high intensity aerobic exercise, the pressure gradients of oxygen and carbon dioxide cause movement of these gases across the cell membranes. So here we see a diagram of this. On the blue side is deoxygenated blood and on the red side is oxygenated blood. So we see the air come into the lungs and then it's moving this way to the heart and then eventually pumped to the rest of the body. Now essentially what these changes in pressure gradients allow are the more rapid swapping of oxygen and carbon dioxide molecules from the blood and into the muscle and from the muscle into the blood. So the muscle more readily accepts oxygen and more readily allows carbon dioxide to diffuse back into the blood and be brought to the lungs to be expelled. Now recall that blood doesn't only transport oxygen and carbon dioxide, but also byproducts of exercise and waste. So most of the oxygen in blood is carried by hemoglobin, and carbon dioxide removal is from its combination with water, and then delivery to the lungs in the form of bicarbonate. So during low to moderate intensity exercise, there's enough oxygen available that lactic acid does not accumulate because the removal rate of it is greater than or equal to the production rate. But as soon as the aerobic exercise level exceeds the lactate threshold, which we've done work on in the past, it's converted to blood lactate and then it accumulates in the blood. And this is known as the onset of blood lactate. So to summarize, acute aerobic exercise results in increased cardiac output, which is enabled by increased stroke volume and heart rate, increased oxygen uptake because now we have greater cardiac output and greater oxygen availability and demand. We have increased systolic blood pressure due to that increased stroke volume and the heart is now contracting harder with each beat. We have an increased blood flow to the active muscles and a decreased diastolic blood pressure. I also forgot to put on this slide, increased ventilation rate. So that sums up the acute responses to aerobic exercise. And in the next video, we'll be talking about the chronic adaptations to aerobic training programs. Notice the difference. We're not talking about aerobic exercise, but aerobic training, meaning that it's consistent and continuous. And we're not talking about responses, but adaptations. And so we'll be covering that in the next video. If you guys had any questions, let me know down in the comments. Otherwise, I'll see you guys on the next video.